is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. What do you call it then? Sneak peek stop, stop, stop. Sneak peek. <laughs> good morning. Good good morning and welcome to our part one of MBD through PLM, our 2020 webinar series with our guest presenter today, Gary Karn from Dassault Systems. You're not gonna say I'm here? You're, you're, oh. We also have Gary Bell from DCS here. He's <laughs> jealous that I didn't put him on the title slide. As a reminder, you can ask questions throughout today's event. We will be answering some of those questions on the side. We'll be answering some of those questions on the side. Um, and we'll be uh, voicing those to our presenters as we're able. We have two Q&A sessions set aside specifically to answer questions, one after each of our pre presenters today. There's a brief survey at the end of today's event after you leave the webinar. Please take a moment to answer those questions for us. They're just things like, what topics would you like to see? What can we do to improve our webinars? And if you have any questions that we didn't get to, you can put it in there and we will follow up afterwards via email. During today's event, you will get the best possible quality by using your computer speakers or a headset. We recommend doing that if possible. Otherwise, you can call in. Uh, anytime you call in for audio, you, the audio quality is gonna be a little bit crackly. So like I said, if you can use your computer speakers, we highly recommend you doing so. If you have audio problems, please first exit and re-enter the webinar. Oftentimes those issues are from a connection issue and those are then corrected when you exit and re-enter the webinar. If you still have any problems, please use the raise hand button and we'll contact you via the chat and work with you to get those resolved. A recording of today's session is going to be sent out tomorrow morning uh, with additional links and some content. Today's model will not be available for a little while yet as it is going to be using version 7.7, which will be released later on, probably March. Our 2020 webinar series will continue in February with another guest presenter, Daniel Dressman, who is with us today watching. He will be showcasing perceived quality and setting tolerance objectives using the 3D experience live rendering. Very excited to be showcasing that. After uh, February's event, we'll be moving into our version 7.7 short series. This is going to be a couple of webinars which will showcase new features in version 7.7, as well as at least two webinars on FBA compliant modeler. As a note, before I move on, if you sign up for any of our webinars in 2020, you'll be signed up for the entire series. If you're unable to make any of those events, you are automatically going to be sent the recording of those webinars. So if you can't make all of our webinars this year, that's all right. Sign up once and we'll make sure you receive all the recorded events. As I mentioned, our two presenters today are Gary Karn, Technical Communicator and FTA Specialist at Dassault Systems. Gary Karn has actually been working with companies to leverage 3D data for more than 25 years and has spent now almost 10 years with Dassault Systems as a technical lead for FTA. So he knows his business when it comes to FTA and model-based definition, helping companies move away from 2D drawings and try to focus on their 3D master process. Most of you are aware of Gary Bell, our Senior Variation Analyst and ASME Certified gd t Trainer. Gary does a number of our training courses as part of our training team here at DCS and is integral to our outreach to customers and clients when it comes to technical support, especially when in our pre-sales environment. Gary Bell is also our, one of our senior variation analysts, so if you have a question that's highly technical in nature or uh, difficult, a lot of times Gary Bell will be tapped to take care of that for you. Is that right, Gary? Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> that's the cue that if you have some, some issue that's very difficult, <laughs> Gary Bell is going to be your... <laughs> Throw me under the bus. <laughs> so our agenda today, we have two parts to today's event. The first half to be creating and organizing your PMI and CATIA using FTA. Gary Karn will be showcasing this portion 
which we'll be showing Tolerance Advisor and creating FTA, how to organize your FTA. What I'm very excited about is using your FTA to create section views, 2D layouts, which are your drawings that you can export from CATIA and that are tied to your CAD, and how to view models using um, Dassault Systems' free 3D XML player. The second half will be with Gary Bell and using 3DCS for optimization and validation of your GDNT, allowing you to extract constraints and GDNT from the model and different methods of looking at that information, analyzing it, and pushing it back to the CAD. We have a couple of sneak peeks for version 7.7 tucked in there as well, which will be nice to see today. Just real quick to put this into perspective, we're talking about in the 2020 series, model-based definition through PLM. So what we're going to be discussing is how to leverage your GDNT throughout the entire product lifecycle. And the reason that's important is because moving to a 3D master process, moving to a model-based design process means that everyone throughout the entire product lifecycle is going to be tapping into that 3D model in order to get the information they need. When it comes to measurement plans, when it comes to inspection, reporting, root cause analysis, and monitoring, everyone's going to be utilizing downstream information from the 3D model, pulling drawings out of the model, pulling the, the, um, the GDNT, the datums, the locators, everything's going to be pulled from that model. So it's important that that model is set up and optimized early on in the process. The reason that's important is because, as any engineer knows, tooling changes, rework, anything that has to be changed in production is going to cost a small fortune, millions of dollars. While that same change done in the 3D model early on in PLM and the product life cycle is hundreds of dollars at most. So we want to try to simulate, analyze, and find any of those issues as many as possible as early as possible. And you can do that by validating your GDNT and optimizing it for, you know, as part of DFMA, Design for Manufacture and Assembly. This is the 3D master process. So using that model throughout the entire product life cycle as the single source for information. The SO system's been pushing this for quite a while. You can see all the different groups and downstream applications that can utilize that model data. I think that explains that pretty well. Today we'll be focusing on the GDNT and design portion of our PLM process. And in February we'll be talking about our perceived quality portion. Today's model is going to be a gear shifter, a manual gear shifter in CATIA V5, with standard moves plus mechanical moves. At this time, I'll be passing the presentation over to Gary Karn. Great. Thanks, Ben. And, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, show my screen. There we go. Great. Perfect. And, um, as Ben mentioned, I work with a lot of companies that are working on implementing a model-based design or a 3D master process. And one of the first things we always do is talk to them about why they want to do that. And we really get two sets of answers when we ask that question. One has to do with eliminating the effort and the frustration of creating and maintaining uh, 2D drawings and keeping them synchronized with um, with the, with the, the 3D, the 2D and the 3D synchronized. And to do that, we need to create annotations. So we need a 3D model, first of all. We we'll use this model here today. We need to make, make annotations that are graphical. So they, they're they human readable, what we call them. And they, that means that you can use them in place of a drawing. So anywhere you would use a drawing, you can take this 3D model with its 3D annotations and people can read it. And the second set of answers that we get that are maybe more interesting for today is to make these annotations um, machine readable so that we can uh, have a computer read them. And to do that, they need to be not only graphical, but semantic. So they need to follow a set of rules or standard, and they need to be attached to a specific feature in the 3D. And the way we create those in CATIA is with functional tolerance and annotations. So I've 
finished my 3D model. I'm in the part design workbench. We're going to switch now to functional tolerancing and annotation workbench. And, and if I were going to uh, create some annotations in here, if I wasn't using the CATIA functional tolerancing and annotation, let's say I was creating this uh, in a drafting application or you know, on the drawing board with my stencils, I could put any kind of tolerance I want. So if I take this flat surface on the top, for example, and I want to create a, a tolerance on it, I could say it, I want it to be cylindrical within 0.5 millimeters, right? Uh, so this is graphical. I can read it. I can see it, but it's not following the rules of the standard. Obviously, this tolerance doesn't make sense. So cylindricity on a flat surface doesn't make sense. It's not... Uh, semantic it's not following the rules so so it, well, to create those annotations in hey gary yes. one of the when you say the rules we're referring to the asme standard or the iso rules right right so exactly so if i'm going to create these in kati i'm going to use something called the semantic tolerancing advisor and that keeps track of a couple of things it keeps track of what standard i'm using so if i look at this today i'm using like, a, like gary just mentioned the ASME standard, I could use ISO or the Japanese standard. You can customize these if you need to. Um, and it keeps track of what feature in the part that I'm going to attach this to. So if I pick this flat surface, again, it's only going to give me uh, choices that make sense on, on a planar surface. So cylindricity isn't one of them, right? I can put flatness tolerance on there. And, and you can see now there's already some data references here. So where did those come from? Let's, let's back up for a minute and talk about where those came from. I've already established some datums. We'll look at what datum A and B are in a minute. But just to let you know how this was created, if I want to create a datum, that's simple enough. Just pick the geometry and create the datum. And then if I want uh, a datum reference frame, I can say, OK, I want C to be a datum reference frame. And you can see I've got that choice in there now. So um, that's where those came from. We'll look at exactly what what datums A and B are in a minute. But let's go back to creating my tolerances. I'm going to relate it to datums A and B. Now my choices get limited again. And so let's say I want angular tolerance 5. And let's add another one, profile tolerance one another. So I would use the, again, the semantic tolerancing advisor to create um, all of my dimensions, tolerances, uh, notes, whatever goes on here. And, and eventually I would get something like this. Now this isn't too busy, not too many parts, but even with these number of annotations, you can see this is starting to get busy and hard to read. So I need some way to organize it. The first way it's organized is similar to what we would have on a drum. Right? So they're organized in captures, which are you could think of similar to drawing views. Right? If I look at the uh, the left view, so it's only going to view some of the annotations that are in that view. And it's going to give me a viewing angle, but I'm still in 3D, so I can rotate this if I don't understand the part. So I've got some views that look like drawing views. There's a front view and a top view. Uh, I've got a section view. Again, still in 3D. I can rotate this if I need to. And in this one, I've even got a, a view with uh, notes like you might have on a drawing. And, and when you activate that view, the part body's hidden. So I just see the, the text of the notes. So that is great to make uh, something similar so the way you'd use a drawing uh, to kind of replace the 3D with something I can I can read and it's organized. But there's some things I can do with this that I that I couldn't couldn't do if I had a 3D model and a separate 2D drawing. So I'm going to turn on a little filtering uh, dialog down here in the corner and start to explore this part some more. And let's assume that I'm looking at this part for the first time. Maybe somebody else built it and. Uh, and put the tolerance on here, and I'm exploring it. Uh, I might see this hole here with no 
no notes, no dimensions on it, nothing. What is this all about? If I pick that, I can quickly see that um, here's the note, here's the note for it, here's the dimension and, and all the information because it cross highlights. And if I want to filter it and look at just that, then I can. And of course, the opposite is true. If I pick this annotation, I can see there's the four holes. And by the way, that's those four holes are that and B that we were using earlier, right? And let's assume uh, also, if, if you think about, uh, maybe I want to um, do this by type. I want to look at just the datums, for example. Um, there's datum A and, and B. So datum A is that bottom surface and datum B. So if you think of a, a big complicated casting, maybe a cylinder block that has a complicated datum scheme and you would have to look through several pages of a drawing to find the datums. Now I can filter very quickly and look at my datums in uh, in 3D, all in one one view, and, and look at them. And so let's let's do one more thing. I'll turn on those dimensions that we created at the beginning on the top, right? So now you can see there's uh, my dimensions, which are related to, or my tolerance is related to data A and B. And this is what now we know what data A and B are. So very quickly, I can I can do some filtering and and and, and and, and explore this and, and, and run. So the other thing I want to talk about that are that, that's important is how do we share this information now? If somebody has CATIA, obviously they can do all of this and look at it, but how do I, you know, if I had a drawing, I would roll it up and put it under my arm and go to a meeting. All I need is a table to share it with people. How do I share this 3D with them? So let's talk about, first of all, sharing it in 3D. There's several ways to do it. All the things we're doing today can be done in Katibi 5, which we're working in now, or 3D Experience, which is uh, sometimes called Katibi 6. And depending on which version you're using, we have different ways to share this model. But one way that we'll talk about sharing it in 3D is if I just save this as, go to the Save As dialog and choose 3D XML, I could save this as a 3D XML file. It has the geometry and the annotations included. And then there's a there's a 3D XML player that's available on the SOS website that's free that you can use to review all this information. So if I, you know, kind of in place of a drawing, I need to be able to see the views that we that we did or the captures, right? There's the top view and the section view it's interesting it it's like it's still 3d it's you're kind of still, like a 3d pdf yeah you're still rotating it around right right <clears throat> right so i've got the views i've got all the annotations i can i, I can view that the the other thing that the people ask a lot is okay if i wait till everybody's ready to consume this in 3d it's going to be really hard to get started with my model-based design process. So how can I create a drawing? Well, the last thing I want to do is do all of this work, create all these annotations, and then create a drawing, create more annotations. Now, which is the master, the 2D that people are using in manufacturing, or the, this 3D master? So I want to keep this as the master, but still be able to create a 2D representation of this part. How can I do that? In, in Katia, the way we do that is with something called 2D Layout for 3D Design. Now, 2D Layout for 3D Design is another uh, workbench in CATIA. You can you know, get it as an, an add-on or shareable to your CATIA configuration in V5. If you're working in 3D Experience, um, 2D Layout for 3D Design is gonna be included with any mechanical design world. So you will have this eventually when you move to the next version of CATIA. So it's a good thing to learn to use in V5. So if I start that workbench, it's going to tell me uh, I want to, you know, it's going to ask me for a sheet size and a, and a standard. I'm going to use the same standard as my annotation set. And so it looks like I'm creating a drawing and you'll see a split screen come up here. Now, so I've got this drawing sheet on my left and 3D on the on the right. Uh, if I look at the specifications tree, though, it's the same. So if I go down the tree and that's I highlight the part body on the 2D side, it's going to highlight on the 3D and the geometry highlight. So it's the same thing. I'm looking at it 
2D window on the left and a 3D window on the right of the same uh, the same thing. And in fact, all of this, the layout, and the 3D is all stored in one cat part. So if it, if this layout essentially becomes part of the 3D master definition. It's, it's stored in there. All right, so let's expand this window and we're going to start to make this look like a like a drawing, the first thing I'm going to do is add a, a title block and a border. I do that with the same tools you use in CATIA drafting, right? So, but now instead of creating views and annotations on here, I'm going to use those captures that we already created and looked at and just make them part of the drawing. So if I, uh, I can start to place those. So if I take the, uh, start with the front view, that makes sense, and place it. And then left to next. So you can see it's starting to put drawings on here, uh, views on the on my layout, uh, top view, and then and then we'll put a couple more views on here. We're going to put that that section view, and then of course we want to make sure section plane gets put in the view where we want it. And one last thing, let's make sure, of course, we don't want to forget those drawing notes that we had. So we'll put the notes over here. So quickly, we've we've put all of these uh, views with the dimensions are all on this, this layout. And one thing that's different about this, I, I mentioned that it is, um, you know, the, the 2D and the 3D are all Part of this, the same thing. So let me we, we call these views transparent views because they're really looking at the 3D. And just to illustrate that, let me zoom in on this one feature uh, here uh, in the 3D and the 2D at the same time. So the, the height of this boss, you can see that dimension of two millimeters. If I make a change, if I make a change to the tolerance or if I make a change to the actual geometry like I'm going to do here. So instead of three millimeters, I'm going to make that five. And as soon as this updates, you'll see the, um, the, the oh. geometry updates and, and updates on both sides, the dimension and the geometry. So <clears throat> and then when I get uh, this done, um, when, when I need to share this, so this is a nice shaded views, and that's great, but if I wanted to send this out to somebody, I need it in a different format. Uh, when I'm ready to publish this, I can I can create a, uh, a cat drawing from it, or a DXF file, or maybe a PDF. This is a PDF that I created ahead of time from it, right? So, and when I do that, it's going to, um, it's going to do the cross hatching and the hidden line removal and, and look like what you would you'd say a proper drawing. Uh, and of course, it's got the title block and all that information in the notes. So we've we've talked about a little bit how to how to share this either in 2D or in 3D with 2D layout, and we've talked about um, how to create the annotations so that they're not only graphical, human readable, but also semantic or machine readable and the question you might be asking now is how do I know that this these are the right tolerances and the right values uh, and I can't answer that question well, I know I knew what to put in there because Gary Bell told me to so now we're <laughs> gonna turn this back to him and let him tell you how how we know if these are right and how we confirm that uh, that we've got this thing tolerance to correct it. Right before we do that, I actually have two quick questions. I just sure. want to see if we can clarify. The first one, of course, is going to be um, for FTA. Does that require an additional license? Uh, yes. So for functional tolerancing and annotation, uh, FTA is the is the trigram, and you would uh, get that as an add-on or shareable and add it to um, to your your Could base you configuration. It. Now, if you're using PLM Express, there are some packages that include FTA and and 2D layout. So, so on that regard, um, for the FTA license, 
that allows you to create FTA, right. but you don't need it to use or read FTA. Is that correct? That, that's correct. That's correct. So yeah, without without the FTA license, I can view the annotations. I just can't um, I can't edit them or create them. Okay. So so if you had a shareable license, you know you could share that within a, a small team. Yes. Yes. All right, and the same thing for your 2D layout for 3D design, that fork Tia V5. Right, right, right. So you can create the layout. If you have the license, you can create the layout. If you don't, you can still view it. Still view it. Great. All right, last question. Sure. Um, and I, I know you already answered this, but I, I want to, uh, it, it was asked still, so it'd be good to, to <laughs> double down on this in the sense that um, when you update the data on the 3D, does it also update? The information in your drawings and your layouts in, in the layout yes because the layout remember their layout is the same annotations the same geometry it's not derived from it it is the same so the you make all the changes in 3d 3d is the master and the layout will always reflect it you just got to get people 3D. to go back to the the model to get the the layouts and the drawings and not start using a separate 2d set Right, right. And that's that process change moving to the 3D master, right? Yes. Got to get people to trust the, the 3D model. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, Gary Karn. So as you said, we're now going to be passing this, this model information to Gary Bell. Gary Bell, if you want to say hello. Hello, everybody. Yes, now it's my turn. Yeah. So... One second, I gotta get this out of my way. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. Mm -hmm. So now, um, Gary was dealing with a single component <clears throat> and putting GD and T on it. And uh, we ended with the question, are the numbers right? Well, those numbers are based on the final requirements of the final assembly. So now we're going to move into 3D tolerance analysis, <clears throat> which is 3DCS for Katia B5. If I come up here in the start menu, we are integrated into Katia. So underneath the analysis simulation, you will see a uh, <clears throat> application 3DCS variation. This gets you to the desktop that you're looking at on my screen right now. <clears throat> um, currently, I'm going to go ahead and just assemble this and hit deviate. And you can see, yeah, you can see the parts are jiggling around. I had to look up on the screen and see how you guys could see it. And you can see this number changing. And every time this number changes, the uh, software is building another shifter assembly. And each shifter assembly is different because 3DCS is applying the GD&T tolerance variation to the detailed parts. So when you do tolerance analysis, <clears throat> there's three main inputs. Moves that define how these components go together. That allows me to animate this through my build process, and you can see it assemble. Measurements that define what it is we want to verify. <clears throat> so if I click on these measurements down here, you can see it's highlighting. We want to measure, you know, how much is the tip of this shifter varying, or, you know, how much is the shaft varying? The variation is going to decrease as we go down this shaft and the shaft is attached right here. So when you look at when you look at this, um, all of the 3DCS information is stored in the applications folder of the product file. And inside this applications folder, kind of like the uh, drawing file, everything is connected. So if I click on a part, it's linked and you can see how it's highlighting in the Katia tree as well as highlighting in our tree. Inside our tree, you can see I have the GD and T defined at the detail level part. Everything is highlighting. And this allows us, we take this GD and T from 
the FTNA, and we apply that variation to the detail part. We don't deviate the physical solid part, so you can see we will create a mesh on this detail part, and the mesh is what we will deviate. So when I deviate this, you can see this surface, if I put it in a side view, it's moving up and down and it's tipping and rocking according to this one mil position profile tolerance and this 0.5 angularity tolerance, as well as there's a position tolerance on these holes. Then those, <clears throat> those tolerances link when you get to these moves that are defining this surface context to this surface, this pin goes into this hole, and these are all the definitions of how these components index to each other. So if I, oops, sorry. So I'm trying to go through this quickly, but if I, um, if I summarize, the parts have the tolerances, which can be uh, extracted FTNA, which you see here, or you can tolerance the parts within our workbench with this icon over here. There's moves that define how these parts go together, which can also be extracted from CATIA constraints and joints, or you can define your moves with this icon here. And there's measurements that define what it is we want to analyze. So you can write their measurements here, and then you know, you're gonna see a sneak peek, what's coming out in 7.7, is we can also extract um, the product FTNA as measurements in our model. So if this model is complete, I'm gonna go ahead and do a nominal build. <clears throat> and you can see now, you know, now you can see how this piece is moving up and down due to the surface tolerance on the base. That moving up and down moves this axis up and down, moves this up and down, moves this, you know, so everything is connected. <clears throat> So this model also has the ability, because CATIA has um, motion moves, I can, just so you can see it, I'm not going to look at results with it at this time, but I'm gonna activate this motion move and I'm going to deactivate this contact move so that it's not over constrained. And now when I build it with tolerances, it will actually go through a range of motion that's defined. So we're rotating this L bracket, simulating you know, a cable on this feature here, pulling this. And you can see as this gets pulled, it pushes the link up, it rotates this, and, and now you can see our shifter moving. So at a later date, we can uh, look at you know, kinematic simulation but we're not gonna do that at this point. I just wanted to give you a little visual because this is a mechanism with a shifter. If I toggle this back to my nominal build, now I'm gonna go ahead and run an analysis. So if we talk about creating the model, you define your moves here, you tolerate your parts here, you write measurements here, this is your graphic animation, and then you run a simulation. So you're basically working your way down the right-hand column. Everything on the left, you could just say are utilities. And then um, besides our add-ons here, you can see these icons on the bottom are CATIA icons. Because we're integrated, you can cut sections, you can do anything that you do in CATIA. You just go to our workbench when you want to do tolerance analysis. So now I'm going to go ahead and run an analysis. I'm gonna build a thousand simulations. Real quick while, we're, while that's running, um, can the GDN, <clears throat> the, okay, can the GDNT measures be extracted from piece parts? Yes, they can. You will see that when I move on to uh, the extraction portion. <laughs> 
that is a new feature in 7.7. You'll get a sneak peek. Um, I'm only going to create measurements. Well, now that this is done, I'll talk to this. So, so now I just ran my analysis. I ran my analysis and you get all of your measurements across the top here. So if you look, you know, here's my seven measurements down here. And this is the data here. We're going to focus on this measurement here. You can see um, as I click on these measurements, this list down here changes. And this is showing you, if we look at this first measurement, it's saying my uh, positional tolerance is 6.34 millimeters. And down here, it's listing which tolerance on which part, what was the input tolerance, the geometric effect of that tolerance on this measurement, and the percent cause of variation. So when we look at this model, this is a you know great example because uh, we are measuring how much is this how much is this knob moving in we'll say in the x and the y direction. If I separate this and I click here the number one cause of that feature moving in the X and the Y direction is a Z surface tolerance, that profile tolerance that we just talked about on this bracket. So when this bracket or when this bracket surface moves up and down, it takes this with it, it takes this with it, but if this link is fixed and this link is fixed, it makes this piece rotate. Now, you might not see that right away. So I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of a new feature for 7.7. So if I build this and I say, well, this is strange. How can this tolerance be, you know, such a big hitter? If I go into this, or if I right click on this tolerance, I can say visualize effect. And when I say visualize effect, all it's doing now is moving that one tolerance. So you can see this is, this mesh is where the nominal is. And you can see as this surface is moving up and down how this part is tipping and rocking. And you can do that for any of the tolerances in the model so that you can get a visual of how does this Z tolerance affect my shifter in the X and Y. This model also has <clears throat> measurements of this shifter in the X or in the Y and in the X. So if you look, if you look at this X and Y measurement, this is um, old school. We used to, if we wanted to know how much is this shifter varying, we would have to measure it in multiple directions. And so we measured it and you can see in the uh, Y direction, it's moving 6.2 millimeters, 6.12. In the X direction, it's moving 2.34. But if we wanted to say, hey, what positional tolerance would this feature fall within, that's this GD and T measurement. So we now have added new measurement types to the software, which when I come down here, if I go into this measurement, this is our new measurements where you can measure position, profile, perpendicularity, angularity, parallelism, and concentricity. We don't have any form measurements in this type of uh, measurement. So the idea now is if I, if I um, build this model again, or if I, if I separate it, this measurement, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, this measurement, <laughs> I'm clicking on the wrong feature. This measurement here is the measurement to verify that we are meeting this two millimeter positional tolerance. This is the assembly GDT that we want to verify. Okay, so and you can see, okay, we're not meeting it. Okay, we're out of our spec of two millimeters <clears throat> because we're getting an estimated range or a recommended position tolerance of 5.45. So the key, you know, is, is how all of these tolerances are linking together and how you can use the visualize effect to see how they 
uh, affect the particular measurement and how we have a new measurement that would eliminate the effect of having to have this X and Y measurement and you can just use a single position tolerance measurement. And when you're all done, the last thing you would do, if we have our results, oh, I'm sorry, if I double click on this, it's gonna go to the typical histogram variation, which, you know, this is a new, this is also a new output that gives it to you in first the chart format spreadsheet, and then you can look at it with a histogram and it's the same, it's the same data for this particular measurement. Once you have your data, then you build it and you continue on down this list and generate a report. So I'm going to go ahead and click this button. You can choose what you want in your report, cover page, summary, GD&T, moves, measurements. So, and you can create this report in HTML, Excel, PowerPoint, or Word. I'm going to quickly create an HTML report. It's going to overwrite an old report. And when you're creating those reports, um, the GDT section. So it'll show the GDT callouts. Absolutely. And that's that's across all of our platforms. Correct. Correct. So so now I get a cover page, I get a model summary, uh, I get my data here, you know, in my analysis results. So again, this is a spreadsheet. You can you can see as I mouse over, it took a picture of where that measurement is. There's some other measurements that I didn't even cover in the model. And if I, you know, if I click on this now, it gives you the results <clears throat> here. And if I go to my model inputs, my GD&T, you can see it now documented, you know, well, it documented all your GD&T and it took snapshots of that as well so that you can see where your GDT is applied, on which parts, and, and what your uh, input tolerances were. If I go over to my uh, assembly sequence, you can see it's highlighting the features, and I can mouse over and literally see the sequence of how these parts are put together. So all of this information you get with the push of a button. But that's not why we're here. So now um, we covered the basic inputs to a model. What we wanna do now is see how did we get here? I talked about you can write your moves and your measurements here. Um, I kind of skipped over, you can also write moves and measurements down here. These are joints and constraints. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna close this model Now I'm going to open up a new model that doesn't have as much information in it. So you could see, you could see the process. It looks like it's the same model. But when you come down here, I have no moves. I have a few measurements, but I don't have the measurement of this piece here or this surface here, which uh, is the uh, assembly GDT. If I look in this model, up inside Katia, you can see I have um, product FTNA defined here, and you can see I have constraints defined, and I even have a mechanism defined. And I, of course, I have FTNA. So if I have this model, and I want to do tolerance analysis, first thing I'm going to do is import my CATIA constraints. So I'm going to click on this button and it's you know asking me what do I want to update. I will pick the top product and you can see it pulled in one joint 19 constraints. Okay. If I come down here, now you can see I have all of these moves. Now, designers can define
joints and constraints, not always what works for 3DCS because they're working with perfect parts. We have to deal with non-perfect parts and dropping degrees of freedom. So after I extracted it, you know, I'm going to deactivate this move right here because it's kind of over constraining it. And you can see it came in with a motion move. So now if I do a nominal build and hit deviate, it's going through its range of motion. And if you, if you see, these parts have tolerances on them. Okay, so it's jiggling around. Is that visual? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. So now I have my moves. I don't want it to go through range of motion. So I'm also going to deactivate this and um, activate this contact move. And I'm going to do a nominal build. And you can see now it's building in one position. However, you can, if I turn my mesh on and I zoom in, there's no variation here. I haven't extracted my GDT yet. So now I'm going to go ahead and extract my GDT. And what I want to show you is that uh, that button is right here. So I pushed one button to pull in my moves. I'm going to push this button to pull in the GDT for this frame. We have um, <clears throat> Smart Search. So I only want to pull in the GDT that's functional to my moves. So if I hit Extract, Oops, if I pick on this part after I set it to Smart Search, this takes a little bit longer because it's going to, you know, it, it can't just randomly pull in all the GDT. It's got to look at what moves were written and what measurements were written and see if, you know, what it needs to pull in. It's going to come. This is probably where I should say do to do. <laughs> See if we have a question real quick. Actually, I have, I have one for. There we go. Oh, there we are. <laughs> so now you can see um, it pulled in 10 GDT callouts, and I got some more mesh. What's wow. in, What's interesting is I did not get mesh on this face here, even though I have this, you know, angularity callout. This face meshed though, and the reason why that face meshed is this surface is a functional face for this lever bracket to mate to. And since that surface is there, I have this GD&T right here, which is, you know, controlling the distance of this face to this face. So now, unfortunately, it meshed this face as well. But after I extracted that, I can now hit deviate. And now you can see I'm back to everything, um, everything deviating. So the next thing I got to do is let's pretend, I mean, I do have some measurements, but I also have some product gd &T. So this is a sneak peek. If I come up here, there's a new button here now that's going to say update gd &T measurements. And when I update gd &T measurements, I can create measurements for every gd &T note on an individual part as far as, you know, profile position, perpendicularity, as we discussed. But I only want to pull in any measurements based off of the product, gd &T. So when you look inside my product, I have these two callouts, which are this position tolerance right here and this profile tolerance. I made them a different color. It's, I guess it's not really a good color for, for the background. But if I, uh, if I pick on this top product, you can see, hey, it pulled in two gd and callouts. Now, if I come over here, you can see I got two more notes here. And that's, you know, datum A, datum D, and datum E. 
So at the piece part level, those same features were called datum A and datum B. At the assembly level, I call it D and E, because the idea is now we can write measurements to any datum set. So you can measure the position of a hole or a pin back to A, B, and C, or D, E, and F, or whatever the, the datum reference frame was. So we pulled in the datum reference frame, and we also created these two measurements. And notice, I don't know if you noticed, but because that surface didn't have a mesh on it until I pulled in the measurement. So now that's a functional face, so it put a measurement on it. And so um, I can now build this, run another analysis. Man, I'm really close. You do not. So while this is running, I mentioned that moves, tolerances, and measures. You can create all of them inside 3DCS Workbench directly. But if the information is available, if you have CATIA joints and constraints, you can use those for your moves. If you have FTNA, you can use that for your tolerancing. If you have, actually, I guess if you have piece part or assembly GDT, you can pull that in as a measurement if you would like. So we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get closer and closer to utilizing any information that happens to be in the 3D master. And now you can see I have, you know, two more measurements. <clears throat> and because this measurement, this is a great example. So the variation of the knob is six millimeters. The variation of this feature here is 5.2, okay? Because the geometric effect, if we come up here, you can see these geofactor numbers, 3.4, 4.6. And if we go to this one, they went down, okay? Because the closer you get to your locating features, the less geometric sensitive it's going to be. So, but if we look at this one here, I'm trying to get there. If we look at this one here and I separate this and I click on this, I click on this feature here. Okay, this surface is still my number one contributor. So this surface moving up and down is causing me not to meet my requirement. Very strange, but it's true, and I tried to, you know, prove it to you with the uh, visualize effect. So I'm going to go ahead and double click this. Uh, I'm sorry. Double click on the tolerance itself. And I'm going to change this number to 0 0.5. I'm going to change this one to 0 0.1. What's happened there? One. Apply. And I'm going to rerun it so that we can look at the results again. But before I do that, because I'm worrying about, actually, I, I'm doing okay. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll say, okay, we'll leave this sitting here, build it. Gary, is your profile a form oh, tolerance? Here, here. Tell. Okay. Okay. Gary, can you hear me? I don't think so, Brenda. <laughs> In this new analysis. What is it going to be showing different from the one you already have? Well, I'm I'm hoping that <laughs> I'm hoping that the the variation of the top of the knob decreased because the number one contributor was the surface tolerance on that face. That's why I, I left this results up. So we're looking at six point zero six is how much the shifter knob was varying with the original.
And then you can see by changing that tolerance, it dropped down to 4.88. So this is where you would now play around with your tolerances until your measurements were all within spec. And if I go in, you know, if I go into this tolerance, now you can see position three is the number one contributor. Let's see what those uh, what that is. Maybe it's still. No, it's not. Well, I'm going to separate it and then that. click on it. Yeah, okay, so now, now it's the position tolerance on that hole. So we decrease this tolerance, and this becomes the next largest contributor. And so, you know, there can be other meetings. We have, you know, advanced analyzer optimizer that can quick help you, you know, a little quickly, a little more quickly optimize your tolerances. But the idea is you can you can optimize your tolerances and rerun it until you get what will meet your assembly requirements. Now, that being the case, I just changed that tolerance. Let me go back up to my frame. Yeah, so I just changed this tolerance inside 3DCS to 0.5. So if this worked and uh, my model was all you know optimized and I got it the way I want it, then I would say push this back to the GD to the FTNA. So this change has only been done in the 3DCS workbench. But if I push it back, now you can see the profile updated to 0.5. So this change now is changed in the 3D master. And if I uh, <clears throat> take it one step further now, I'm gonna go into this frame I'm going to open it in a new window. There you see it changed here. And this is the same frame Gary Karn was working on. So it's got, uh, now I might need some help. Just yeah, double click anywhere in the layout. Okay, so now I'm going to double click in the layout. <laughs> And so it jumped over to what he created. And if you zoom in on the front. And if I zoom in here. View, you'll see the. You can see it changed it in the drawing. So the idea is, is we pull the FTNA in, we do our tolerance analysis, we modify our tolerances till we get our numbers to be what we want. We push it back to the FTNA, which auto links to the drawing file. And so the drawing file updates and I think this works both ways, right? If both I, ways. If I, you know, if I go in here, so now, since I pushed it back, let's see if I understand how this works. I can, I can go into my um, GD&T for this part. Sure, you uh, could change it. Here. Here, if you. I'm looking for it. Well, you can just double click on it. Oh, thank you. In the screen. Sure, so. I think that's what you want. You sure. want to change that tolerance. So, yeah. so I'm going to change this back to two just to you know, make it crazy. And I say, okay. You can see it updated to two here. And then I go back to my model. I go back to my model. And of course, it's not going to be two in here yet. It's still going to be my 0.5. But I can... Uh, I gotta make sure. I'm... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's the two here that got updated. So now I would just have to come up here and re extract, re update my GDT. Uh, I'm gonna do smart search again. Oh, that's my error. Does the profile to tolerance require a D DRF? It, well, no, it does not. 
So profile, and, and Gary didn't cover that, but profile by definition can be related or unrelated. If profile is unrelated to, to a DRF, then it will be treated like form. Oh, it's still going, I thought it was done. So Gary showed you, <clears throat> okay, there we go. So now if I come back to um, <clears throat> that GD&T, now it's back to the two millimeters. Okay, so we pull from the CAD, we make changes, we push it back to the CAD. Um, and then um, because it's in the 3D master, it auto up will update the drawing file. <clears throat> and it's tied to, everything is tied to the master. So I can even double click on, I can even double click on this. Let's see. Sorry. I think it's going to do it. Double click it again. There we go. So it's three millimeters. This is going to be crazy. I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to make it 10. Let's say, okay. Uh, I think I got to do an update. Keep going. Now I really went, oh, there we go. Beautiful. <laughs> I really went rogue there, but I did that and you can see it auto updated the dimension, which most likely that means if I go back to my, uh, my layout. Oh, I got to go to the, to the zoom, right. Just zoom out. Oh, thank you. And then I'll right click on the layout on the, in the tree. Uh, right click on the layout in the tree and then say update restore show state the Pop. second one from the bottom and that should turn the talent the, all the annotations back on but it didn't well let me finish i it might not be done yet let me go back to okay. let me go back to my model because uh well so right now we'll we'll get back to that in a second if i go back to um I go back to 3DCS. Um, yeah, so you can see my surface is way out here, but my mesh is here. I can still build this, and it's still building to the original place because we don't ever want the model to break right away. But because I did make that design change, I'm going to come up here now and use another button. If I can find it. Must be this one. Update geometry. And I'll pick this frame. Now you can see my mesh just updated to the new geometry. And if I do a nominal build, now it's locating to, oh, I have to update model also so that my CGR will update. Let's do a quick test. There we go. There we go. I just made a design change. Move that, move that bushing out. Now it should let's see. So uh, I'm pretty sure window. Let's go into the frame itself and see if the frame has updated. Okay, so the frame is updated here. So then, if I go here and I click on my layout. Let me close the other one. A window. Let's just close this one. And then here we'll double click on the layout. Oh, I lost it. It's not showing. So maybe. Somehow got hidden. Yeah. Okay. That is, that's perfect. That's my dog and pony. That's perfect. It ends, I, I was five minutes late, guys. I apologize. All right. Um, Any questions? All right. <laughs> Just uh -oh. have some people saying so, hello. Um, we got a, a number of people from across the world with us here today, and it's very exciting to see them all. 
um, including France and South America and Brazil. Um, there's <laughs> people are just asking about your your, your profile tolerance. They say your profile call out's a little off. Um, what? So for <laughs> my profile tolerance is off. It's profile to A and B, and my my datum scheme is A is this surface and B is the whole pattern. So That's I right. don't I don't need to have a datum C. And uh, yeah, it should should be fine. All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're a few minutes past the hour right now, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Please keep an eye on your email for that uh, recording of the presentation tomorrow, along with some additional links of uh, related material. And remember that signing up for today's, today's event has signed you up for the 2020 series. You can cancel your registration at any time, but this is done for your convenience. So in case you miss some of our other events, you are going to be receiving the recordings automatically. I want to thank our guest presenter, Gary Karn, for joining us today in our DCS headquarters. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Thanks for having me. This was fun. We're hoping to have you back again and joining us next year for our user conference in 2021. Uh, we have a couple quick questions here, but I think we can take them offline. They're, they're pretty um, specific and detailed. Okay. So I think we'll be able to take care of those as we are six minutes past the hour. And I don't want to keep everyone longer than we have to. So once I close out the webinar, please take a moment to fill out the survey. All of your input is very important to us. and does help us determine what topics we do for our webinar series. If you have additional questions that weren't answered, there's also a place to put those in so that we can email you directly and get your questions answered. So thank you again for joining us today. And I hope you all be with us in February for our next event. Thank you.